back. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Welcome back. High energy. High energy. Got to do the self-talk thing. Welcome back. About two years ago, I did a video called something like, we did all this in nine months. The amazing garden tour from Sandy Backyard to Edible Eden or something along that line. I don't think it was quite that long, but it was like that. Little did I know we would be moving again, but the move actually was a good thing because we moved to our own land and we have better soil now. So this is our new nine month garden tour and you could see how we took this area of grass, which was just fenced in for some dogs and had nothing but grass and weeds in it and turned it into a backyard food production machine fountain. We'll start here in the herb and medicinal garden. I think it's important to have your herbs right near where you do your cooking. And our kitchen is right back over there. So we can walk out here and get our herbs. And you know, if like somebody is hemorrhaging or, or there's a massive contusion or they have uh, tuberculosis, yellow fever, etc., we can come out here and we can treat it without having, you know, to go too far. So it, it saves us from going to the urgent care because it's only like, you know, 20 feet. Just put some comfrey on it, you'll be good. So we've got our yarrow, we've got lion's ear, we've got a native St. John's wort that you're not supposed to take because it's supposed to be somewhat toxic. We've got rue, which is definitely toxic, but it's like old school. I think it wards off vampires, that's important. We've got oregano and rosemary and some flowers for fun. Some uh, lemon balm and some lemon thyme. And this is a big celeriac, which just looks really cool, and it attracts the insects in. You can see that it's in the Apiaceae, aka the carrot family, how it looks like carrot flowers or Queen Anne's lace or elderberry flowers. It's in that family. It looks really neat. I love it. There's a dahlia a chaste tree, which balances uh, female hormones. This is uh, dill. And we've got our African blue basil. We've got mullein. Lavender, more dahlias just for fun because my friend Elizabeth had some. We have we have some pot plants <laughs> for you Brits, um, leftover pots. And here here is our lamb's ear, right over here. That's good for uh, staunching bleeding. We use that all the time as I swing my machete around. Then we've got a little rhubarb, which we know won't do well. We've got some more dahlias. We've got some chocolate mint. We've got sage. We've had our we've got our culinary mix and a few onions and other things. So this this area is pretty convenient, and we've got to be careful because this is the gardener's enemy right here. This is Bermuda grass. Some of this area was Bermuda grass lawn, and we were not able to get rid of it all. Even though we lasagna gardened and did some other things to try and crush it, it does come back. So it's a little bit of a fight. Eventually you beat it, you stay on top of it. But it it's probably the only thing that's more aggressive than mint. You just gotta keep throwing it out and letting it dry. Now as we get a little further here, there's stevia and catnip. For some reason the catnip keeps getting squished by some animal. I think it's like a small panther or something. Sometimes comes and lays in the middle of it. This is where we had our potatoes. And we got, at last count, we've gotten 197 pounds of potatoes so far out of the garden. And we have not pulled this row right here of Kennybecks because they're not quite ready. And I still have some russets we're experimenting with down there and a few other rows of lackluster potatoes in here that weren't quite as happy as these were. This area just had a little bit of manure and ashes thrown on it and then we tilled it and mounted it up and now I've got a clean it up and plant something else. Either I'll put a cover crop in here or I might do some rows of okras or beans or something like that. Haven't decided yet. We kind of have this little division right here. This is the yam bed and this is also the division of where we have not weeded. So this area from here to the herb gardens is kind of a weedy mess because it was in the potato beds and we haven't taken care of it yet. But these are the Mostly Dioscoria, a lot of varieties that are growing down through here. 
in here were where we had originally our real gardens and we started to, I started sticking in some sweet potato slips the other day, which look kind of sad right now. But these are some I planted about a month ago and they're catching up. We have a lot of small insect damage going on and it's nothing that I would spray for, but it's just annoying right now because it slows down the plant growth and it makes them not look as pretty, so they're not quite as photogenic. But I would rather have holes in the leaves than spray any poisons, so I don't, I don't do that. But what that tells me is, and the abundance of caterpillars that we have, is that we don't have enough wasps. We need more wasps, we need more predatory insects. And often you'll find when you plant a garden that all the predatory insects uh, don't come in as fast as the pests come in. So your pests will show up first and be a problem and then be like plague proportions and then suddenly they're just getting wiped out by some predator. Or it might not be until the next year that the predator species have built up. But what I'd like to do is make some wasp living quarters out here so they can just come and patrol. Because if you didn't know it, wasps aren't just of the devil. Everybody thinks they're like wasps. You know, bees, I can get behind bees. Wasps are of the devil. They're just mean-spirited and they're nasty. Well, they are, but they eat a lot of caterpillars. And when we had wasp nests right next to our gardens, I deliberately hung mailboxes over the fence, old mailboxes, and they built nests in them. The wasps tore the caterpillars to shreds and our caterpillar problems went away. The wasps will just poke around in the garden, hang out on the plants, and hunt all day long. These collards are about done. They've got to go to the pigs. I'm tired of collards anyways. So anything I get tired of goes to the pigs. We've got some nice carrots. Uh, this year we actually got our carrots in at a good time. And we did a mix of carrots this year. Some of them we probably didn't thin out well enough, but you know, what are you gonna do? I've never been great on carrots because I've mostly been in tropical environments and oh, there we go. And in the tropics, carrots are not really um, the greatest thing to grow and they were not even really particularly that good for us in Florida. So if we get smaller carrots, some of you up north are just gonna laugh. Like, ew, David gets carrots. Look at those carrots, they're so dumb. Uh, but they still taste good, kids eat them. And it's a minor vegetable for us. It's kind of like a go out in the garden and snack on them. And off camera, all the ones we pulled have been like that big. Like every single one, it's incredible. Thousand pounds of carrots so far. It's just, you're only just seeing these. Uh, it's just hard to find them, you know, when I'm under pressure. But normally, <laughs> carrots like that. Don't, don't look at that. That's not mine. That is not mine. Did, what is it? The dog dropped that or something? Oh my gosh. Okay, let's, let's go somewhere else. This is wheat. My, one of my little daughters planted a patch of wheat to see what it would look like to grow wheat. It is not the happiest wheat I have ever seen. It doesn't make particularly great kernels, but this is not really a wheat growing area and she did get to see how it grows and she got it all planted and I don't know that we're gonna get bread out of that, but it was worth doing. Now, Here's where it gets beautiful. The grocery row garden system. This is my little experimental gardening system. If you've read the little grocery row gardening booklet, you can see how I laid it out. But it is a mixture of an orchard with a food forest, with vegetable gardening, with, with everything that you wanna throw in there in between to make yourself happy. It kind of gives you a framework, and it works exceptionally well. Um, we have been getting, I actually have to send the kids out to pick again. We've got about 20 pounds of cucumbers so far. And the interesting thing about it is this is, uh, I think this is the third, third year saving seeds from cucumbers and letting varieties cross. So we are land racing cucumbers. We put five or 10 varieties together and just scattered all the seeds all over and then we added a couple more varieties and we scattered all the seeds together. We let them all interbreed and then we save a few of those giant blimps when they get like that big and they, they look like a little melon. And we save the seeds from them. 
and we, we plant them again. So this, I would say, is, is successful. This is actually the best we've been doing on cucumbers in a very long time. Cucumbers are not necessarily the best adapted to uh, our anarchistic gardening style because they like to be planted at specific times and taken care of and all that weird stuff, you know? So um, it's, we're trying to breed for robustness. Did the kids come out and hunt some already today? They've been very popular. Uh, I, I see kids walking by eating cucumbers all the time. But as you can see, there's a, there's a mixture of plants in here. You know, here's a, here's a pear, here's another cucumber, here's a Chinese yam, here's a cold hardy banana, here's a mulberry, here's some of our biomass cannas, more cucumbers. You just keep talking about cucumbers. Keyword, cucumbers. Thank you, algorithm. This is a Rachel Mulberry. It was this big, and then we got that nasty late freeze after it was all in, in fruit and leafed out and looked gorgeous, and that just about killed it. It killed it back to the trunk. Killed the entire top six feet or so of it. What are you gonna do? It's hard to believe that it's actually only been uh, nine months that we've been in here. It's actually astounding. Uh, back here we've got uh, one of my sons is growing tomatoes. He's my tomato grower and I just let him do what he wants to. So we put in some beds and he's got a bunch of varieties there and if they live, they live and if they die, they die. So far he's gotten a few tomatoes out of them. Not gonna worry about it. It's, I don't, I don't really, I never, I always count it amazing if we get any tomatoes because you see this is the kind of stuff that happens with tomatoes in uh, Florida and lower Alabama. When we get, it'll be dry and then we'll have torrential rains and all kinds of issues like this where they split and bugs get into them. It's always amazing. It's like you might as well just eat them, just get used to eating them green. Oh, I prefer them green. Oh yeah, I'd never eat a red tomato because you'd never get a red tomato. Now that's not to say you can't grow tomatoes, you can, but uh, we've done much better with the Everglades and smaller cherry tomatoes than we ever have with the big ones taking a quick break to pick a few more cucumbers. I like the pickling varieties better than I like the big slicing varieties. Picklers are my favorite and I, I like to make pickles so we're gonna make some home fermented kosher dills, like live fermented, not with vinegar, but let the bacteria do it for us. And uh, these, are, these are about the perfect size for putting in a jar. You could see how we kind of integrate different layers here. The uh, yams are up top here. These are the mostly Dioscoria alata. And then underneath, we've got this space down here, so we've got two layers. So here we've got some cucumbers. Here we've got some watermelons. And if I had done better at it, I would have had another watermelon or two down here, but instead I just have bare ground. But I can always stick things in here anytime I want to. If you keep it mulched, it keeps things from getting too crazy. This is the uh, Dioscoria pentaphylla that uh, Derek sent me. Guess, boy, over a year ago. This is a very interesting yam variety. Very uncommon. It doesn't make nearly as big a root uh, in the first year as, as the Alata does, but really neat to see because it's it's like five it's got five instead of one it divides into five that's just cool so starting from here this is probably our least interesting row unless you're really really into yams but um, on this row here next to it we've got another variety of yam that is very interesting uh, the bull bills for this one will sell for like $25 a bull bill this is uh, the edible bulbifera variety, and I was able to save extra bulbils. I bought two of them. Yeah, two of them, it was expensive. Um, and I planted them last year, and I got about 15 or 20 bulbils out of that, and now I have planted those and scattered them around through here. And 
you know, these are gonna go up and over. They look really cool. They'll be really pretty during the season. And then here at the base of it, this is an edible root elephant ear variety. This is actually taro. So I can, we can dig this up and eat the roots off of it, which is really cool. And it looks neat and it's tropical. These I planted in the fall. They actually just look like they're dead for the entire season. They're beneath the ground and then they pop back up again in the spring. And then we plant zinnias because it's one of my favorite flowers. I always like zinnias. They're really easy to grow. So I, I put zinnias uh, everywhere. I just put little pockets and just pull a little pocket like this in the ground, stick a few seeds in it and then let it grow and if it grows, it grows. And I usually put three or four seeds in there and then I'll thin them out. If I get three or four coming up, I'll take two or three of them and plant them somewhere else and then leave the remaining ones to grow. We put in sunflowers. We've got uh, more mulberries. This is a white mulberry. There we go. It's only made a few this year because it's a baby, but this, this variety is delicious and it tastes like honey it's it's different and it doesn't stain so you could plant this right next to your patio it wouldn't be a problem this one's called white ivory it's from burnt ridge nurseries more wandering watermelons i have a note on these watermelons these watermelons are ezekiel's land race watermelons they're exceptionally vigorous this year um they are they're getting into weedy territory, which I really like because I don't like to work too hard. And I think after a couple of years of him saving seeds, it started to make a difference. They're starting to adapt to the area and we're saving seeds from the ones that do the best. And the, the ones that actually make fruit with little care. So they they've generally have all been grown without irrigation and mostly without fertilization. This area here has a little bit of manure in it and some ashes, but um, <laughs> they're, look at them. I mean, they're just insane. They're gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous watermelons. It's like, they, it's like they belong here, and I think they do genetically now. Thank you, Joseph Lofthouse. Here's our first melon that's coming in right here. We don't know if it's going to be orange or red or yellow. Could be anything because the... Uh, melons all crossed up and it seemed like the orange ones were actually more vigorous than the reds so there you go uh, we'll see what it is I had I had orange melons like into the fall uh, last year from his land race project which is awesome a little bit of sugar cane here got a little peach tree I have some seedling peaches and I have some grafted peaches I have a peach from my old friend uh, Alan, the beekeeper, that is a, a cross between a Nemagard rootstock and a fruiting peach. And we're going to see how that one does. I actually think it's this one. Yep, that's the one. Okay. I don't remember these things. I'll just find out later. Oh, yeah, that kind of looks like it's a cross between a Nemagard and something else. Yep, that's right. The last three beds here are just kind of flush with flowers, which is kind of fun. I, I, just, I just couldn't help it. I was like, okay, forget. I have been a brutal utilitarian for too long. I'm getting old. I'm going to plant some flowers. Oh, I'm going to have a flower garden out here. I just love my dahlias. That's a little calla right there that's coming up. And then the lantanas, which are basically a weed. I love them. The flowers are a good attractor for butterflies. So I could say that they're, you know, they're super functional and stuff, but basically I just like to mix a whole ton of things together and I've enjoyed having the flowers. And it's kind of fun to cut flowers and bring them in to my wife and put them on the table regularly. Um, pomegranate here. This pomegranate, I think, yeah, it's gonna bloom. I thought it had a bloom on there. It's coming in, so that's interesting. Pomegranates are not ideal to this location, so I am starting more from seed and planting them here and there around the yard. So we can hopefully find some genetics that will adapt pretty well to this area. It's not that they don't grow, it's just that they tend to look really spotty and brown and sometimes they spontaneously die. At least they did for me. The wonderful is not the best variety. Some of these zinnias here are 
astoundingly beautiful. This color, I think, is just something else. These are really good. This is a great cut flower zinnias because you can just keep cutting them all through the season and they keep coming back. And then right alongside it, we've got a ginger that's growing right through the zinnia because I didn't remember where I planted the ginger roots. So there's there's ginger scattered all through here. I've got the regular culinary ginger and the galangal ginger. We've got this apple tree that we trained to go sideways. And it's actually it was a little slow waking up this year. It was a very weird winter. Actually low chill hours, but a few really brutal freezes. So it was very destructive, but it wasn't enough time to get some things to give us a proper um, period. Oh, you should take a look here. This is an elderberry which you found growing out by the milking area and transplanted over here, I don't know, I reckon about four or five months, six months ago, something like that. We stuck it out here and it looked like a little sad stick. It was about that tall. I just busted it out of the ground with a broad fork and my son planted it right in this row and, and I love it. I love the elderberries. I love how they attract some of the pollinators and that is an excellent medicinal as well as being a very pretty plant. There's also some research that I that somebody shared with me that the root systems of elderberries are very good at attracting beneficial bacteria or fungi or something like that. So you should plant them around other plants to make other plants happy. So you can see how my companion planting works. Basically, I just throw a whole bunch of plants together and what survives, survives. That's Volt. Cassava is starting to come in. And then underneath the cassava, we've got a little bit of sweet potatoes. Got a black cherry that showed up in here too. There's black cherry seedlings here and there. I'm gonna pot them up and grow them up larger and put them in my plant nursery because that is a very useful little tree. It actually becomes pretty big, uh, but both being edible and being a good uh, plant for fast growing, beautiful timber. This little tea rose was growing at the other property and it was completely unhappy there and looked like a little sad stick with a few leaves on it for about a year and a half in that nasty grit. And if we planted it over here and suddenly it's just been blooming and blooming. You can see I deadheaded it the other day and there's four blooms on the ground and we've cut other ones. This cassava looks great. This is gonna be epic. We're gonna recover. Recover our cassava stock after a really bad winter destroyed quite a few of our cuttings. This is Big Gem Tobacco. This is a very nice, uh, large leafed tobacco variety. It's hard to get the tobacco started, but it's easy to grow once you have it. So there you go. It's, uh, it's just a pain in the neck on the front end, but after that, it's not that hard. And I just cut the leaves and hang them out to dry. And we're gonna experiment with rolling some cigars and stuff this year. This is another variety of cassava that's a very, very pretty type. This is a better suited variety to further south. It didn't make as much roots as the more green variety. However, it's exceedingly beautiful. So if you were in zone nine or 10, and you, you can get those red stem ones, that's really neat. That's pretty cool. Got some lilies here. We're doing a little experiment. Muscadine vines climbing over this trellis. One of the muscadines it grew on the other side, it froze down to the ground, but it's come back, so um, I want them to kind of just make a mess and meet in the middle. Here I've got more cassava. Got Jerusalem artichokes back here. This bed got tilled up, and then the weeds came into it, and we did not get it mulched in time. And so this bed is just absolutely full of nut sedge and grass and other stuff. So I am going to now that I know where the Jerusalem artichokes were, I couldn't do anything to chop into this ground or till it again or anything to clean it up because I wasn't sure where the Jerusalem artichokes were. They took a really long time coming up. So we'll just crush this down and do some lasagna gardening over it, lay down cardboard, lay down a thick layer of mulch and crush all the weeds around them. And this will be one of the richest beds in here. So, you know, it will recover it. It's just one of those things that we didn't get around to in the right time. And it's, you know, an ounce of prevention and a pound of cure and all that. If you, if you had your mulch on in the right season, David the Good, this wouldn't be a problem, David the Good. So there you go. I'm just gonna wait and crush it down later. This last one right here, 
This is a variegated form of cassava, which is incredibly beautiful. That is a very lovely tropical plant. And as it gets taller, the canes have this beautiful pale yellow. They're more pink and red right now, but uh, as, they, as they get taller, they get more and more pale. And the violent red purple stems stand out and this gorgeous pattern stands out. That's a very interesting mutation. And it's not the most productive variety, but we grow up because it's beautiful. And I'm trying to learn that. I'm trying to realize that if the Lord made a whole bunch of beautiful things and put them around us to bring joy to our hearts, we shouldn't just be like, I am a brutal utilitarian. I want to live in a box and eat a protein supplement that keeps me alive. No, there's food for the soul as well. I was listening to a composer, uh, Palestrina, choral music from the church, 1500s, and listening to these choruses and how beautiful they are. Is there any reason to do it like that? No. No, you could do something really simple if you wanted to, or you could just read the lyrics. But 15 voices, men and women joined together in this beautiful chorus, that's something else. And that feeds the soul. So I'm trying to do a little better at, at bringing in some beauty into the gardens, not replacing all my gardens with ornamentals. We have to have balance, we have to eat. But putting a little bit of beauty in as I go and making it not only a productive place, but a place that feeds both the body and the soul, if that doesn't sound too weirdly sentimental. And I, and I really enjoy just coming out here and seeing the different flowers pop up in between all the gingers popping up, in between the watermelons, and you've got this big system where everything is either beautiful or useful, and mostly we've gotten rid of the weeds, and I feel very good about that. That's the overview of the garden right now. Nine months from the time that we started this garden, uh, actually a little less, probably about eight, because I think it was tilled the month after we moved in so we're just gonna say nine months but that's pretty from conception to birth nine months that's that that works so thank you for joining me um, if you like the grocery row gardening system I will put a link to the grocery row gardening booklet below which gives you an overview of how you build the system and and though it looks chaotic and it looks wild and it looks like there's not a pattern to it. There is a very specific pattern to it. And then inside of that, you can improvise all you want. It's like jazz music. So we've got the structure and then you can improvise inside the structure and plant whatever you like and whatever fits your climate. You don't have to look at my plants and go, well, I definitely couldn't grow cassava. It's too cold and I can't grow yams. It's too cold. That's okay. There is something in your climate that will work because this is relying on universal permaculture principles. So if you're further north, you might plant apples. If you're down in Costa Rica or something, you might plant bananas and papayas. You fill in that same higher level, um, high shrub layer, small tree layer, you know, with the plants that fit and then you are building the system around it with whatever you have available. Take a cutting of this and stick it here and a seed over here there and, and it turns into this beautiful Eden. And I absolutely love the system. It is the most fun gardening system that I have ever worked with and it's kind of just evolved over time so if you're interested check out the booklet grocery row gardening i will put a link below or just watch my other videos on grocery row gardening if you're too cheap to buy the ten dollar book thanks for joining me i appreciate it until next time may your thumbs always be green discover the beauty and efficiency behind grocery row gardening create a backyard where fruits herbs vegetables and flowers all grow together within proper spacing in grocery row gardening you'll find the tools and systems you need to keep your family fed Thank you.